Welcome to the True Tone Lounge. Today, our guest is Ryan Warner. Hey, Zach. <laughs> Ryan has played with uh, you know, Nashville acts such as uh, Jewel and Leanne Rimes and Gary Allen, and then most recently got off the road with uh, Gene Simmons. That's true. Yeah. So not, not many Nashville guitar players can uh, you know, play with those kind of acts, but yet have the, uh, the, the rock chops to play with uh, Gene Simmons. Well... Just growing up in Nashville, but really wanting to be a rock guy yeah. ever so, since this big, you know. Yeah. So uh, how did you pick up the guitar? Well, my dad plays. Everybody yeah. in my family, with yeah. at least his side of the family, plays. Yeah. Some are awesome, yeah. world class. Some are horrible. Yeah. <laughs> but everybody plays. <laughs> okay. And um, I just always, I don't remember anything other. I've always wanted electric guitars. And my dad would always, like, I beg him to put one on, my, you know, I would be, like, this big. Yeah, and it would always like be a strat or something, and, yeah. and you I, couldn't even reach the you know couldn't even reach to play like a, a big E chord because it was the no not at big. all. And yeah. I was you know I'm three years old, but I was obsessed and had multiple toy guitars, yeah. and I would always like I remember like which day would I which one would I pick that day the <laughs> the silver one or the whatever Mickey Mouse one. So did you have like a, a friend that would act as your guitar tech? You know? <laughs> no, it was all me <laughs> with your little toy guitar. <laughs> it was all me. <laughs> Um, but, um, yeah, and they just, I, I was always like that. And then one day when I was seven or eight, it just, I don't even know how it just transitioned from being a fake guitar to a real one. Yeah. And I just, that was it. And my yeah. uncle who was big influence on me played and he always had like strats. He collected old strats and they were laying around the house, his house yeah. all the time. And I don't know, just one day I was like, oh, I guess I'll really do it instead of just hold it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, that was it. So let's just get this out of the way. You know, it's like uh, your dad is a professional musician, uh, yeah. it's Steve Warner. Mm -hmm. yeah, Very so good guitar had, player. Yeah, see, uh, excellent wish I could play like him. Yeah. I'll get that out of the way too. <laughs> yeah, and has had you know numerous you know country you know, number one you know hits and mm -hmm. and uh, uh, CGP you know from from one Chet Atkins. Few, yeah. You know, uh, so so you're you're growing up and your your dad is a uh, you know a you know a country star. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, you start picking up the guitar. So who are some of the guys that just kind of end up coming by the house or, or people that you end up influenced by? Well, influenced by and guys that came by the house are, I didn't realize till later were the one of the same. Because okay. at the time when I was a kid, I, there was just people around the house all the time. And I'd just go down to the kitchen to get a, you know, something out of the refrigerator and it would be like, so oh, this is my new friend from Australia, his name's Keith Urban, you know, whatever. And then, yeah. Or Chet Atkins would come over the night before Christmas and there would be guitars, or Jerry Reed would hang out at the house, and which was an honor. I wish he was there every day. He was the coolest guy. But, um, you know, I just ran into all these people. Reggie Young, Brett Mason, you know, I remember playing his silver, or whatever, gray silver, the telly, the, with, that's the telly that taught me what a 68 Fender telly neck should feel like. I remember holding that when they were cutting a record of my dad's and I was maybe... 10, 11, holding that guitar, you know. And, um, 
Yeah, there's even pictures of me like as a baby with, you know, yours and my old friend Brad Paisley who's like, he's like a kid and I'm just a baby and I'm like going, I didn't realize it at the time, just been around all these people. But my mom was all, like her favorite records are Allman Brothers Live at Fillmore and Band of Gypsies, you know, the Hendrix record. And so she would just like, she had Clapton playing in the house and I heard Cream and that was what really sent me in that direction. And then she came home one day and got me a slide and had got me an Allman Brothers CD. Uh, it was a CD. Prior to that, she had got me the Van Halen tape mm -hmm. and, was, and she had said, hey, have you ever heard of this guy? You're playing guitar now, you'd probably like him. And so I listened to it and my brain exploded, you know, and or at least it felt like that. And so I started buying all the Van Halen tapes and then reading guitar magazines and Jimmy Page. So I just, I had cool players at the house but it didn't register to me at the time. You know, all these guys I got to meet and be around. Leo Kotke and Richie Sambora and all these just weird. Leroy Parnell, I remember him being at the house showing me the how to play Just Got Paid. I just started getting his easy top. He was like, this is the way Billy actually plays it, you know. And I'm 12 or 13. So it was awesome. But at the time I didn't realize I, I didn't, I was just thinking about, I was all just thinking about Van Halen and those guys who weren't at the house. But then I later realized all the dudes around were, it was, it, it was priceless. Yeah. You know? a, lot, a lot of legends of the guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Sitting around the fireplace with Chet Atkins, and he's with a guitar, you know, in his later days. It's, I didn't think about it at the time, but, you know, yeah. kids don't. It, yeah, <laughs> you it's, always it's, realize stuff later. It's uh, this old guy coming over <laughs> to visit your dad. Yeah, he's like my dad's <laughs> other dad, and he's yeah. just hanging out, and it's Christmas, and, you know, I'm thinking about what, you know, DOD distortion pedal I might have under the tree, you know. Right. <laughs> I'm like, I want one that makes me sound like Van Halen. That's all I could think about ever. So you start you start playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you, you gravitate more toward you know rock players. Yeah, than, and than it wasn't like a I'm doing my own thing. I'm yeah. just I'm not going to be like you and play Telecasters and all that stuff because I love that stuff. Yeah, I just didn't think about it. I just heard that stuff and I heard Van Halen. And I heard Jimmy Page. I was like, and Mark Knopfler and all these guys. I was like, that's it. And then I kind of just took off in a direction. I had a lot of people around me at the time that either through friends of my dad or other musicians or people around town. Todd, who works at Corner Music, famously has been there. You know, everybody knows Todd with the hair and everything. Mm -hmm. He would be like, have you ever heard Jeff Beck's Guitar Shop? And I'd go, I don't know. And he'd go, go to the store and buy that. Go buy a Guitar Shop or whatever. Go buy, you know, anything like that. And I, so it just kind of, it seems like everybody just like inadvertently pushed me in that direction because I couldn't get enough of it. Could not get enough. Yeah. You know the rock, all those rock guys, and I would see the. Yeah, you remember there was a store called Guitar Heaven. Yes. Back in Antioch, that was like my Guitar Heaven. My mom would drop me off there on Saturdays. Back when they were in the gas station and all that, and and uh, they had like a rack of old guitar magazines, and I would see like, I would just like snag all the ones of Van Halen, or then I would see, well, this guy's got a, a weird painted guitar too. It's Tiger, and it would be you know who's this George Lynch guy, and so I would buy those and then I would just go in that direction. I just kind of felt like I was finding the keys to the universe, you know? And so that's where I just kept going that direction. So, yeah. so you also had uh, kind of access to, to really nice instruments. While, you know, most kids when they're, you know, learning to play guitar, you know, they probably have, you know, some cheap guitar with the action that's, you know, an inch off, but you had, uh, you were you were seeing some, some great, you know, professional grade instruments even as you were growing up. Yeah. and. Some of them I realized, some of them I didn't. Like I was telling somebody the other day, when I got into Stevie Ray Vaughan and I got my cassette of Texas Flood and I started trying to read everything about him and I was like, oh, 59 Strat with the rosewood neck or fretboard. I was like, well, there's one of those in the, in the room over there. And so like I, my dad has a 60 slab board, you know, mint, you know, nine out of 10 condition. And I'm over there like trying to play Stevie Ray Vaughan and like trying to play it behind my back when I'm 10, mm -hmm. you know, or whatever and going, oh, this stuff's in the house. I didn't, there weren't any good Les Pauls in the house. I was always like, when it was like the time to be in the rock mode and I wanted a humbucker guitar, I could find anything but Strats and Tellys. So I was like, even as a kid, was like, man, there's not enough rock guitars or anything. Still not realizing <laughs> till, you're la till later, you know, I was like, there's nothing with a Floyd Rose in the house. Yeah. You know, I was like, I, there's nothing with stripes on it. You know, I had to try to stripe my own guitar. You know, and all that. And did you strike your own guitar? I, I, this, yeah, of course. <laughs> I tried. It didn't work. I didn't. Yeah. My uh, young brain did not uh, get the um, 
that the guitar had already been like a professional poly finish with lacquer and all that. I didn't rough it up, so the white spray paint just slid right off of it. But I did try. Yeah. I still have the failed body at the house. My mom has it, actually. But um, So they were awesome guitars everywhere. I didn't realize, you know, I, I, loved, I loved them as guitars and as old guitars, but at the time, they, I was, as a little kid, I just still wanted the rock stuff. But then later, I'm like, wait, there's black guards around and, you know, rosewood board strat, custom color strats, and, you know, the Gretches that I didn't, you know, didn't hit me till later, but I'm like, oh, old 6120s and White Falcons, and, you know, some, some that were Ch like Chet's guitars and stuff at the house, and not really, ri you know. Mm -hmm. I still don't touch those, no, even to this day. I'd still stay. Yeah. There's no need for me to touch them. Yeah. But, you know, but at the time, I remember going, why doesn't he have any Les Pauls around? How am I supposed to sound like Jimmy Page without a good Les Paul? And that just wasn't part of his sound. No. And then later yeah. found out that none of us can sound like him, so it was a moot point. Yeah. So. so what were some of your, uh, some of your earliest you know, gigs? Were some of them you know, playing with your dad? Or, yeah. Or? Well, I went to, you know, I grew up here in town, mm -hmm. not far from here, actually south of town and you know i went to the school where everybody played football it mm -hmm. wasn't a music school you know okay and so i didn't really have any friends that played or anything so the only guys i really you know played with were like if i would sit in with my dad's band or something and it would be not be like shows just sound checks and it'd be like just some 12 bar blues thing or something and there would be other guys around town that i would play with but not necessarily gigs as much you know i would do a few things here and there i had a a buddy Still do. He's a big producer now, but he's a De Derek George. You probably know Derek, and he was at the time playing with Brian White. And I used to like he he was like another SRV guy. He had all these '60 Strats and '68 Telly. Mm -hmm. You know, he was another guy that was like, you should always get a '68. Those are great Tellys. But um, I would hang out with him, and he would drag me up on stage and like play a little something, or we would sit around and he would show me how to play stuff that I still can't play. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, basically it was like with my dad's band or just, other than that, I was just in my room, mainly just in my room, just obsessed with records, tapes, you yeah. know, burning out the motors, getting exactly where the rewind stops, you know. And then a f finally a CD player came in later and I could pause it a little, you know, it was a little more accurate, but yeah. it was mainly just sitting in the room being obsessed with all the Zeppelin records and all the Van Halen records and, Dire Straits and Queen and all the stuff that I still listen to all day, every day. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I was like, I won't grow, I don't, you know, I didn't know where I would go, but I still didn't grow out of it. Yeah. Still the same, I'm still listening to the same stuff I did then. Yeah. You know. So what was your first, you know, professional gig? Um, first professional gig? Like, got, well, yeah. you know, then we got out of high, like, got out of high school, and I thought it was a professional gig, but yeah. I was playing in a, band, you know, that we all lived in the house together. The guy had like a development deal. It was kind of like a Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers thing. And, you know, we were going to make it and lived in a band house and did all that stuff. Stinky van and trailers and wouldn't trade it for the world. But, you know, that was where I did a lot of the really growing up playing stuff. We were riding a van everywhere and opening it for people in like little rock clubs. And it was awesome. You know, we were like, I recently, my buddy who was the drummer in the band sent me these old, whatever, the Hi-8 or whatever, those camcorder tapes. Yeah. And I converted them, and it was like all this camcorder footage from us in the van, like pulling up to these gigs, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe we're playing here. And I'm like, it's places that you wouldn't even <laughs> stop in to get, you know, it's like, it's the size of this room, you know, and we're flipping out. And so we did that for years and just never, you know, the powers that be never let it happen, you know. And, um, and so and I wor was working at a guitar store where an early visual sound dealer, we yeah. used to get the old, you know, Jekyll and Hyde's and sell them all the time. And, and uh, in fact, I still have a couple of the old, that one and the H2O. Very nice. And uh, we, um, and I quit that, I quit working there. I was like, it's been a couple of years and I didn't want to do that anymore. And I was sitting in, and the band had just broken up. I mean, I was still friends with the dudes, but. It was done, and I was laying in the bed one morning, and I woke up, and I had a voicemail from some number, and it was this guy, his name was Chris Graffinino, he's still around, and he, uh, he was a um, band leader for, a, for like a country act, and I remember thinking, what are they calling me for? I, I always, always tell people, don't bother calling me for that, I can't do that stuff, I don't, yeah. you know, 
it's not my thing. And then I'd realize later that it was kind of at the beginning of, oh, they want people to play rock guitar and just, you know, they wanted somebody to do that and be the guitar solo guy or be the whatever. I was 21, maybe, 20, something like that, 22. And, um, and he was playing for that, like it was that country girl group, Shadaisy, remember them, the three sisters? And, I remember that. And, that. and I was thinking, oh my gosh, they're gonna, they're gonna actually, like, and he said, we need a guitar player to become be the lead guy. He goes, I'm the band leader, but I'm the second guitar player. I'm the guy on the riser. So we need the guy down front. He's like, and if you have long hair, you know, and you play, he's like, but, and Rob McNelly, who's done one of these, who's mm -hmm. been like an older brother to me for years now, he had been to college with Chris, and he said, you should get this Ryan kid, he's good. And So he called me and he said, we, we need a guy like now, we're going to pay you this, and it's more than I've been making all week at the guitar store in like one day, you know. Mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. I thought, is somebody messing with me? And um, I was, I'm just a rock band guy. And... Um, he said, if Rob McNelly was my college roommate, he said, you're good enough. If you're, he says, you're good enough, you are. So he said, let's go have a cup of coffee. And I drink tea. So I was like, all right, I'll have a tea. And we met. And, uh, and he um, just said, I want to know what kind of gear you have. You want to make sure I wasn't going to show up with a cell-made spray-painted guitar and a Floyd Rose, you know. <laughs> and, a, so, and a PV Bandit. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. PV Bandit, yeah. And uh, I told him what I had at the time. I said, I got a Les Paul and a Strat, and I'm playing. At the time, I was playing this Orange Amp. They just come back out again, and they sounded really good mm -hmm. for kind of rock stuff. And um, he said, "All right, cool. Rob says you're good enough. You're good enough." And then it was like a week later, I was walking into rehearsal for the first time as a real musician, or what a pro, or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Just in my brain, quietly freaking out, you know, going, "I don't know. I don't." Rehearsals have been like our little jam room where we played Wednesdays and Sundays forever. This is actually like I have to load the stuff and stand here and know the set and all this and. It took an hour to get over that, and then it was, I feel like that was yesterday, and now it's been, what, 12, 11 or 12 years later, so, yeah. yeah. So after Shadaisy, you, you, you started playing with a number of other artists. Who, who came along next? Yeah, those, they were actually, you know, it's always, like, really funny to be like, yeah, my first gig was, like, an all, like a girl group and all that, but they were cool to me, and they just wanted me to play rock guitar, so I did mm -hmm. that. And I realized, that's when I realized I could do that, and then, but, you know, I was just time to move on. And yeah. try to get somewhere else. And um, I, did the, I did a tour with Shooter Jennings where, again, that was like full-on Southern rock outlaw, you know, a whole nother, let's just say, in a complete 180. Shooter's awesome. I love him. I haven't seen him in years, but he's, he was super cool to me. And it was just the, the most 180 you could have from where I was before. And uh, the band was killer. I still talk to those dudes. And it was, you know, a different... I was playing a Les Paul Jr. at the time, 50 watt, 72 50 watt Marshall, just full blast, and it was, it was just sort of like a Southern rock gig, you know. And I'd grown up with that too, playing Skinner. My cousins were really into guitar, and they would be like, you know, they'd have the Skinner tapes and uh, Molly Hatchet. So I was kind of thinking, I'm just kind of that, just sort of that revisited, you know. And then the slide, I'd always been playing slide from my mom giving me that slide. Her Dwayne Allman was her favorite. She saw them like. Almonds like 14 times before he died. Oh, was before obsessed. before and, Dwayne died. Yeah, and she was yeah. a photographer, and I've got all these, like, you know, what do they call them, slides or the little black and white, of all these yeah. photos she took that have never been published. I've got them at my house and just insane. Wow. Insane stuff. And so it was always like I got to do the slide thing because I kind of started getting known for that. And so I started playing the slide and the Southern Rock thing with them and then did that for a while. And then I thought, well, okay, I'm done with, the, you know, I'm kind of done with this. I had gone out of this sort of pop girl thing, and then Jewel called, not personally, but, you know, um, it was Adam Schoenfeld that called me, actually. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you know him. Yes. And, uh, and then ended up doing that gig, and then um, spent the next few years, somehow I ended up being, like, in, not intentionally, just, like, the guy playing with, like, girls. Jewel and then Leanne Rimes for a few years. Still do stuff with Jewel to this day, you know. We, we just really got along well, and she likes the way I play, and... You know, whatever we I'm still there when it happens. So keep coming back to being the guy that somehow can put up with the, you know, the uh, rigors of the road and the female artist. So. <laughs> Wow. 
So besides Jewel, who are some other uh, some other acts that you've played with? Well, and this is just the live stuff. Obviously, I, yeah. I've been doing the uh, you know sessions and stuff all the way, all along the way. Not quite as much as some of our other buddies that have done this, but like I just love being on the road so much. I can't force. I can't make myself stay home. I don't. I love being gone. Really? Yeah, I love it. What is it about being on the road? I don't know. I mean, part of it, you know, being a kid. And my dad always being gone, I was always, at, you're like at one side, one time you're like, this is, I'm bummed because he's gone all the time, 300 days a year or whatever. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I just wanted to be on the bus all the time. I would beg my mom to let me, she would never let us miss school to go. Mm -hmm. She was like, oh, too many ki kids miss school and then they end up, you know, you're going to go to school. Probably good that I did, I guess. But uh, I always just wanted to be on the bus and be gone. They had a Nintendo. We didn't have a Nintendo at the house. They had a Nintendo. And so, um, but, and then my uncle was there. Like I said, he was the one, he played in my dad's band and he was a great guitar player. He played like Knopfler with the, you know, no pick thing. And uh, he would show me stuff and I got a lot of records from him and licks. He showed me how to play like my first Neil Sean stuff. He was a big Neil Sean fan and, and Knopfler and Clapton and stuff like that. So I was just always want to be gone. So I, I think maybe subconsciously it just translated to the same. I'm, I just still love being gone. Yeah. At 33, I'm still like, I'm leaving next week. I got home two days ago, and I'm like, I'm looking at my proverbial watch. I'm ready to get out of here. So anyway, doing sessions along the way, but yeah. never wanted to sit around and just do that, and uh, at least not yet. And um, so it was Jewel, and you know, it still is to extent. You know, she has the distinct advantage of writing and playing all her own songs on guitar, so she can go years at a time and be really self-sufficient. So she just has to have a whim where, like, I want to hear some electric guitar, and then I'm back. Mm -hmm. So in the meantime, you know, it was Leanne Rhymes for a few years. Same thing. She had a killer band. Always has great. She's had every player in Nashville in the band, you know. And, um, but I got called. Joey Canaday was a band leader, and he called me and was like, they need the, we already had a, the second guitar player, Tony Obrada, who's a great friend of mine. I've done tons of gigs with. And, uh, and they were like, well, we need the other guy, the stage right guy and the, some of the, the more lead guitar slide stuff. And although Tony's a killer lead player, but so I show I'm, I, it's Leanne Rhymes and I'm thinking blue and how do I live and all this stuff. And I'm showing up with my SG that I gigged for years, Jewel and Leanne Rhymes era was all this historic SG with a Vibrola. And then I'm showing up with that and a 50 watt Marshall half stack. You know, my, I've got this baby Marshall, a red, I think it's a 71 red 71 little small box head and a green back cabinet and somehow I'm shoehorning this in on all this stuff. The Jewel I played at Deluxe just like this one but ever from there on out it was all 412s and Marshalls even on those pop gigs with girls you know it's four, almost all the time 412s and just so I'm showing up doing my thing and I'm still going I can't believe I'm getting away with this and I'm doing these things where they're starting to go well do a guitar solo do another one do like a Jewel, I would start the show just doing a slide solo on open D. You're like at the down the walkway, a ramp or whatever, ego ramp. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing it with Gary Allen now. You know, it's like starting the encore, just playing the guitar bit, like a Pink Floyd y thing. And I'm sitting there going, I don't know, how am I still getting away with this? Like they don't know that I'm not the guy they should be using, I think. <laughs> but I'm sitting there just going, they're, I'm playing, I think I'm getting away with murder. And they're like, that's cool. And I'm like, well, that's off of, that's a page lick or that's off of. You know, I'm sneaking in stuff that I still can't believe I'm getting away with. I'm just thinking of, I can't even think Brian May or George Lynch or any of these things. I'm like, these guys are, they're letting me get away with murder. So, so it seems like that in the more, more recently, there's been kind of a, a shying away from guitar solos. And then it seems like maybe there's becoming some more interest in, you know, more overt kind of guitar styles. Well... If that was, if you could describe my style as anything, I think overt would probably be the one. Yeah. It's not always the best, but it's overt. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I think so. And I think I just kind of came at the front end of that. Yeah. And they were like, oh, we, we cannot sing for a minute and we'll do a guitar thing. And I just kind of started taking it where I wanted to go. Because I'm not, I've never been the guy to call if you wanted to play the record. Still to this day, I mean, I, I could sit here all day and talk to you about how much I love Van Halen. I could barely play that stuff. I just listened to it all the time, but never sat down and tried to play. Not I never tried to put the lightning back, you know, in the bottle again because that's it was just his lightning. Mm -hmm. And so, 
I'm just always the guy that like call me to just come and do somebody to come and play overtly and kind of as Tony Obrada says grip it and rip it <laughs> and uh, grip it and rip it yeah but I just you know I was never the guy to play the record and I always thought they're gonna find me out and you know throw me out and get somebody that'll play just to perfectly and, per and politely and they just they kept and the more I pushed it the more they loved it you know and so I just I, kept going I think many many artists find out that when they when they get out on the road that they uh, they want to punch things up some because some th sometimes the the recording not that it's sedate but it's a you know the guitar and and other things you know might not be as aggressive as what they need when they're in front of a large audience exactly well, I'm the punch up guy yeah <laughs> that's what I'm going to start going by the punch up the, guy. the punch up guy yeah so so you've you know built this reputation in town as kind of more of a rock guy mm -hmm. and then. How did that lead up to you, you know, getting to tour Gene Simmons? You know, that was, it was great. Um, it was actually funny. It was just a kind of a natural thing. So in the last year or two, doing this playing with Gary Allen, who has been a country guy and everybody, he's has at least heard some of his songs. He's been around 20 years. Great guy. The band's killer. They've all been there 10 years plus. So I'm coming in as the new guy. But it, I was in... And had the advantage of when they when I came in, they just it was the right timing, and they were I was exactly what they wanted, and they were really happy that I was in there punching things up. Mm -hmm. And so I'm doing that, but all the while doing rock stuff in town. Like you, we talked earlier, ended up playing Slide on this last Megadeth record because Dave Mustaine, who lives not far from here now, because all these rock guys are moving to town, they're all coming to me now. <laughs> I always kept thinking I got to get out of here. This is the country here. Now they're all here. But um, so I'm doing stuff like that, but still playing this country thing. Although, again, I'm playing the way I play regardless. Gary, same thing. I go out and I'm pushing it going, I'm going to put this into this lick into this song. Surely they're going to say, dude, reel it in. And he's like, that's great. Keep going. So um, I've got these buddies in town. They do this thing. They're moving to the Mercy Lounge. It's called the Rock and Roll Residency. Mm -hmm. You've probably heard of it. They've been doing it a couple years, Phil and Jeremy, Phil Schaus, Jeremy Asbrock, great buddies of mine. And the first guys that were like, when I met him, I was like, there are other guys like me. I just didn't know when I was 16 years old or you know, 18 years old, there's other people like that. And they do this Kiss cover band, tribute band, makeup and the whole bit. And uh, it's called Kissmas. They do a show called Kissmas and they, it's a big charity show and they, but they do, and like Phil does a killer Paul Stanley impression and all this stuff. They're great. And um, so they started playing with Gene. They did a couple of the Kiss cruises on doing this cover band, and they kind of, through Doc McGee management and all this stuff, they ended up being, you know, they said, well, what'd be easier to get guys to play Kiss songs than the guys who do a Kiss tribute band? At least that's what I, in my mind, that's what they had to have been thinking. And so, and they're both killer guitar players, just rock they're like rock 101. They know all that stuff. And um, basically, there was the gene gigs are sporadic, and and because uh, of Kiss is number one, of course. And uh, there just were dates here and there that they that that one of the guys, the Jeremy, couldn't do, and they're like, well, what's another rock guy that knows all this stuff? And you know, a text message later, I'm doing it. So I'm just learning to set, you know, it's songs I've heard forever. I mean, we've all heard Kiss songs our whole lives, whether we meant to or not. And uh, learn the set, 17 or 18 tunes, and then rehearse once with the band. No Gene. Jeremy actually came out, even though he wasn't going to do the gig, he came out and played Gene's Warrior bass and did the rehearsal so we could have bass. And then, um, you know, we went out and did the gigs. It was just last week. And... Um, you know, there were songs that he hasn't played in 30, 40 years, some that they'd never done with him, and we never rehearsed. We just kind of sat in the trailer backstage with unplugged guitars and kind of went, you know, you know, like, all right, there's a little, you know, and kind of worked it out, and that was it. We played the show, and he was, you know, he was happy, we were happy, and the crowd was happy. So it was basically a text message. That's how yeah. it happened, <laughs> long story short. <laughs> so what was it like getting out there and playing those songs with Gene for the first time. Outstanding. Yeah. I mean, it was this guitar, a tuner, and a, it was a backline, they were backline gigs, so they just had 
you know, you just backline marshals. Mm -hmm. There's no sense of getting in the semantics of pre-73, pre-circuit board, greenbacks. That's all out the window. There are marshals. So you just plug in, get it to where it's not taking your head off. Hopefully, you know, you can get a 900 that'll hurt your feelings now and again. But um, you just kind of plug in and get your sound and, you know, play rhythm there and lead there and go. Yeah. And so, so we're out there, three guitar players, three Marshall half stacks, Gene's playing two Ampeg full stacks on full blast. I mean, the closest, the only, the closest tone it's reminiscent of is like Lemmy. It's full EMG blasted, like gnarly, just gravel coming out of the speakers. And it's awesome. And so, especially, you know, you wouldn't want that on a, you know, you don't want that on a pop gig, but this certainly isn't that. Yeah. And so we're playing, you know, we come out and we, you know, the pre-roll goes down and it's right into Deuce. And I'm like, man, I've heard, I heard this song when I was eight years old and air guitared to it. And now I'm playing it. it. No ear monitors, you know, none of that fancy, you know, modern, you know, accoutrement of stage, Nashville stage stuff. It's like, grip it and rip it back to that. Just monitors, local monitors, guy, just loud. Everything's just loud, and it's the way it was the way it was intended. Let's just put it that we did it the way it was intended, and the way it was done in '75, and it was awesome. Yeah. So, so can you can you tell us? I'm sure you know. What have you gleaned from from Gene from from just being around him? Oh well, you know, we, like I said, it was just the other day. His whole bit was have fun. He was like, if you mess up like smile really big and like go like this, take the credit for it and like laugh it off and keep going. He's like, they don't really care if you mess up. They just care if you're having a good time and they're having a good time. Yeah. So that would probably be, uh, you know, ever like me, like a lot of other people can have that tendency to like get in your head of the amp wasn't right. I think my V1 tube is a little microphonic or something. And you go, man, that really doesn't matter. But, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. You know, and so just have fun, and they have fun. That, that's a that's a great you know lesson because uh, I, I've seen many artists, if they had a little problem with their gear, it will you know mess up their whole show, and they forget that those people aren't there you know to hear you uh, to hear your guitar tone so much. Yeah. They're there yeah. to have a good time and for you to entertain them and to yeah. play some great songs. Oh, yeah, I've had gigs like I've I've been on the road with this Matchless, you know the ubiquitous, you know, HC30 matchless that everybody has in town. For, with a, but with still with a Marshall 412 for the last few years, which still punches them up, you know, mm -hmm. kind of makes them semi marshally But, and you know, I'm getting like, oh, my tubes ring in or these are going down. I'm like, they don't, they just want to hear the song that they came and paid the money to hear that they loved on the radio in 1999 or whatever. So it's easy to get in your head because the guitar players, we always get in that minutia of all the stuff. and. You know, does a Mallory 150 really sound smoother than an orange drop? And all this, you know. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. And I'll come to find out a lot of the guys that we love with the best tone have never thought about that for a second. Yeah. You know, they had other people thinking about it and sounded good, but they just thought about playing and having a good time. And yeah. Also looking back on all the guitar players that you've met through the years, or, or musicians and producers, what are some of the best pieces of advice that you've gotten or things oh. that you've learned? I'll tell you something I've always learned, not advice, but something I've always learned from drummers that I've been on the road with. And I've been on the road with some awesome drummers, guys that I still can't believe I've played with, is just be around the artist enough. Don't fly too close to the sun, you know. Just stay off the radar and you always look like the cool guy. That's the one thing I always thought. They're like, oh, he's cool over there just dealing with whatever. Who knows what I was actually thinking about or who was yelling at me on the phone that day <laughs> or whatever, you know? But they're like, oh, he's cool. He's over there just like nothing bothers him. But that was always from drummers. They always stayed off the radar with the artist. That's great advice. Yeah, that was the number one thing I sort of just picked up. As far as advice, I don't know. My dad's, my favorite advice from my dad was always sandbag the sound guy. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Like, at sound checks, wherever you are, never turn your guitar past seven. <laughs> he goes, do you want extra gas in the tank? You know, you always want extra gas in the tank. So, you know, it's not quite when we're doing these, re you know, rehearsals for tours where there's monitors and we're buddies, but like, you know how it can be sometimes. Just sandbag them. 
you know so you think they think that's 10 when you got that you know that's probably my favorite <laughs> that's uh, it's even funnier coming you know coming <laughs> coming from your dad you yeah know, sandbag the sound man <laughs> exactly and he you know and he was never a, he's not a gear guy like yeah. the only reason he's into gear now is because i've forced him i'm like you would like this guitar you want this amp you know and he's going okay cool that is that does sound good but he had like played you know one guitar forever they would tape a TS9 on the stage, gaff it down with the gain all the way off, and he would either have like, you know, two twins, or he didn't care, he'd play twins or Hot Rod DeVille's or whatever. I'm envious of people that can play through anything and still, I'm over here going like, I can't do anything with this amp. <laughs> but he just, you know, he wasn't back here, so it was all right here. Yeah. So the volume knob is way more important than people give it credit for sometimes, so. Or a lot of people do anyway, so. That, I don't know, that's probably my favorite advice. Well, what's up next? Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, actually. All the while we didn't talk about, it, I've been doing this rock band for years. I've got this rock record in, the, in my pocket that, you know, it's seeped out. We play shows very rarely. It sort of seeps out. The other day, somebody came up to me and was like, I heard you have this. I was on a session, actually, and you know Mike Brignardello legendary bass player and he's like I heard you have this rock band like it's kind of secret I was like well it's not really secret it's just not really you know I have it in the car you know and so I've got him a copy and so like now and so then I get other people like I was on a session with Mike and he heard you have this rock band and you know whatever and so it's kind of this thing so I'm actually got a bunch of stuff personal stuff that's been sort of partially done forever that we're working on and it's full on you know it's like we had to like in mixing go back and decide we have too many Marshalls on this. Like, there, we have to scoop, scoop out some rhythm guitars for the solo to even be heard. You know, like, we've, we've over, you know, I'm not saying Mutt Lang level, but we've done a lot to this. So who's, who's in this band? Uh, it's, I don't think it'd be, it wouldn't be anybody you know, really. Um, okay. th but also, it's kind of one of those things where me and another guy wrote the tunes. Yeah. And so, are, so are you singing? No, there's a singer. It's a friend of mine who was actually in that very first band with me, the one that we lived in the house together and, Made you know we went out, came back from touring with had to pay money you know like we had to pay overdraft fees and stuff but he and I have been working on songs since then two thousand and you know fourteen fifteen years now we've had all this stuff and these records you know have been partially done forever you know it's, I've got five songs mastered after all this but um but there's plenty of people on the record there's it was like three or four bass players a couple drummers you know. It's just kind of one of those things that it's been going on going so long that it's like whatever it takes to get the song right. So we end up all kinds of different people on it. But as far as the guitars, though, I was selfish. I was like, I'm gonna we're gonna stack everything and I'm gonna play everything myself, and just really nerd out in the studio. I get my favorite, you know, my old favorite few hundred watt Marshall heads. I got some old ones that they that only get used in the studio because they're so they'll knock your teeth out, you know. And so we get them in the studio and we're like, okay. Les Paul, we do the Supro guitars, we slide and sneak strats in, and it's just an excuse to use all the huge pile of gear that I've somehow tucked away all these years. So, and you also have kind of a little side band with uh, Audley Freed that uh, played at the Black Crows. What's the name? Yeah, that's that's called Sons of Zevon. And you play around town. Yeah, we do. I haven't, unfortunately, we haven't done it in a while for scheduling reasons. But uh, it's Audley's band, him and uh, Jamie. Ruben, the guy who owns the Family Wash, they kind of started this thing years ago, and they're like, they're all 70s music aficionados and lovers, and they're like, why don't we do a band of all 70s stuff? So it turned into being like these shows where each show is a year from the 70s, and it's like, a, we do like a two and a half hour set of just, and not necessarily like, I remember oddly asked me to be in the band, he was like, just so you know, you know, we don't, we do the stuff that we love, he's of course we're gonna do a Zeppelin and a Stones, he goes, but like, the guys bring their wives too. So we'll do, you know, kind of, I don't have anything to do with the song choice. The bass player Kevin and Oddly do the majority of that. But um, it's like, let's see what was the top. They go look at the billboard charts and go, that's a silly one hit wonder, but wouldn't, it, wouldn't people love it if we did that, you know? So I end up learning these songs that I never thought that I would, you know, obviously I've spent years, you know, learning the Stones and Zeppelin stuff and who, but it's like we're doing all these, you know, crazy deep cuts by like, oh, you know, like, I can't even think of examples. Just you name it. It just if it was popular that year, we'd play it probably. And so that's pretty fun. But 
you know, typically we do third Lindsley gigs about every four or six months, but it's been, um, it's been a minute. So uh, I think I'm just waiting for him to call and say, all right, you got 25 more songs to learn. So we do that and I've been working on my stuff, yeah, in town. Sessions, you know, like we talked earlier, I did play on that last Megadeth record. Mainly for, and it was a slide thing. They just were like, Dave saw me play slide because him and my dad had become friends and he was like, you really have the slide touch. He's like, I need this melody on this song. So I'm in, I'm at, I'm playing on the Megadeth record and just cool stuff like that. Yeah. And, but usually when I get called, it's like that. It's like we said, they need a rock guitar solos. They're like, I get called to like punch up tracks. Like, well this, there's some rocking tracks, but they're not quite punchy enough. And so like, my buddy Rob calls them the Jock Jams remix. He's always like, come over here, we're going to do the Jock Jams remix. And it's like, bring your modded Marshall and this guitar. And we stack guitars and solos and stuff. Because people want all that now. I just, was, I just came at the front end and it just sort of ramped and it worked perfectly. But um, still got a few Gary Allen gigs down the line. I'm still working with those guys just because I love them. Like, they're like, they, they're brothers for sure. And then uh, there's some more Jewel stuff coming up. I'm going to get back into small amp pop world. So, uh, and then uh, some other things we can't talk about, but there's other stuff coming down the line very in the near future. So, but that's basically it. Just trying to punch up stuff. <laughs> punch it up. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm.